Okay, so our last speaker of the day is Matt Jacobs, and he's going to talk about extending the GPO thing beyond gradient uh, great. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you to uh, Simone and Katie for uh, inviting me to talk here. Um, it's really been awesome being at the uh, Simons Institute um, for the last two months and also the next two months, I guess. Um, so this is a joint work with um, a bunch of people who uh, at some point were at UCLA. Some of them are also still there. Um, and yeah, this is just going to be a, a collection of a couple different things. Um, and what I really want to talk about is, okay, um, can we use the JKO scheme to evolve some equations that are really not Wasserstein to uh, gradient flows? Um, and I'm going to focus on uh, just one particular model today. Uh, but in fact, there's actually uh, a lot of different places where you can do this. Um, okay, so uh, the model that I'm gonna look at are these kind of tumor growth models. So here, uh, Rho is modeling the density of some uh, tumor, right? So we look at all the cells, we sort of just average them and zoom out, um, and that's our density. And then the other thing is, right, these, these cells are growing. They don't really like touching each other and they sort of push each other around and that induces a pressure. Um, and so basically you should just think that uh, this pressure is like some increasing function of the density um, and it's going to uh, push, push the cells, okay? And so that's basically uh, this first part of the equation over here. Um, but of course, right, these, these are tumor cells, they should be growing. Um, and uh, so on this other side, we have this growth term, which is going to be a decreasing function of the pressure. And the idea is, right, uh, these cells don't like competing for space. And so if they're in some region where there isn't a lot of space left, they're gonna grow really slowly. Uh, but if uh, you know they're in a region where there's lots of space, then they can grow faster. Okay, and that's essentially what's uh, sort of going on in this picture here. So I have some tumor cell basic or collection of tumor, uh, cells and at the center we have really high pressure so there it's growing really slowly uh, but along the edges it can be uh, growing faster um, and okay clearly right uh, if I didn't have this source term then I would have a very nice w2 gradient flow uh, but it's there and it's very important um, so it's certainly not a w2 gradient flow um, so the uh, most uh, common choice for this coupling between the pressure and the density is just some uh, power function. Um, but the case which uh, is sort of most mathematically interesting um, and also actually very physically relevant as well is when you send this power off to infinity. Um, and essentially once you do that, you're sort of just adding incompressibility to the system. You're saying that uh, the density row can never go above one. And when you do that, you can actually understand the pressure as a Lagrange multiplier for this incompressibility. Um, and now you don't have this uh, direct connection between the pressure and the density. So if I know the density, that doesn't mean that I know the pressure. But uh, nonetheless, they're still going to satisfy uh, this relation, which really sort of is just like a Lagrange multiplier um, condition. Um, and so uh, what you end up getting is you get a free boundary problem that has this sharp interface between um, essentially these cancerous regions and non-cancerous regions. Um, so rho will actually basically always be either zero or uh, one. Um, and so uh, it's, it's numerically difficult to solve these uh, free boundary problems. Um, and, uh, you know, something like the JKO scheme is really nice because uh, anytime you have something variational and implicit, uh, you feel less scared of trying to handle these kinds of equations. Um, I should mention uh, this, this model was first introduced by uh, this really, really nice paper by uh, for Tom Quiros and Vasquez, um, they, they were really the first ones to analyze uh, this incompressible 
uh, limit. Okay, so um, let me just say uh, one more scary thing about uh, these equations, um, which is sometimes really bad things happen. And when do really bad things happen? They happen when uh, the, the density undergoes a topological change. Okay, so basically you can imagine that you start out with uh, the density where it's living on some annulus. Okay, and so uh, I have room to sort of dump mass outside, but I also have room to dump mass inside. Okay, so uh, in the outer ring, the pressure is pushing outwards, but in this inner ring, it's pushing inwards because there's, I can place mass there. Uh, but what's gonna happen is, right, it's gonna grow and eventually I'm going to completely fill this hole. Um, and right at the moment where that happens, all of a sudden there's no room left in the center. And so what that means is actually all of the pressure needs to start pushing stuff out. Okay, so at least the gradient is gonna undergo this very discontinuous change where it was first pushing stuff towards the center. Um, and then all of a sudden it has to be pushing stuff out. And actually it's going to be pushing stuff out, right? Um, sort of, that's actually now where there's the least amount of room to put stuff. Um, and if you look at sort of just a cross section, basically any radial cross section, uh, this is what's gonna happen. So you sort of have these two humps they're going to get closer and closer together. And then at some point they're going to merge. Um, these, these should be uh, symmetric, but um, I can't draw it any better than that. Um, so uh, basically what's gonna happen is right at the moment where this hole gets filled, uh, you have this really bad time discontinuity in the pressure. Um, and uh, you know this, this just is a feature of this equation that also makes it some, um, hard to solve. Um, okay, so that was a scary thing. There is at least one good thing, which is uh, the equation satisfies a comparison principle. Okay, so if I start off with uh, you know, two different tumors, um, I'm sort of considering them separately, but let's just say that I know that one of them started out inside of the other, then actually it will always stay inside um, as these two things evolve. Um, and this is not actually completely obvious because this smaller tumor has a lower pressure, which means it should be able to grow faster. Um, and so you might get scared that maybe right at this point where they're touching, the smaller one can actually grow faster and escape. Um, but it turns out it can't, okay? So um, there really is a comparison principle for this problem. And if you can design a numerical scheme that respects this comparison principle, then that gives you a really powerful stability. And uh, you, know, you can feel somewhat safe that you're actually doing a good job of solving this PDE. Okay, so... That is essentially the goal. So we wanna to try to design a numerical method uh, to simulate this model, you know, that satisfies these nice properties. So ideally we'd like something that's unconditionally stable, independent of the time step. We wanna preserve this comparison principle uh, that this equation has, that we don't have to worry so, so much about some of the really bad behavior. Um, and of course, we, we would like to know that it converges to the continuum PD um, as we send whatever discretization we have to zero. Um, and right, it's very tempting to use a JKO type scheme. Okay, so when you have a W2 gradient flow, you solve it with a JKO scheme, it's unconditionally stable, and it typically inherits all of the nice properties that the continuum PDE has. So if your continuum PDE has a comparison principle, then usually your JKO scheme also has a comparison principle and so on, right? So we would really like to use something like that, um, but at least we can't use it right out of the box because we have a problem where mass is changing. Okay. So um, let me just talk about uh, some previous works 
that have looked at this problem. And uh, of course, this is not at all exhaustive. Um, and so the first one is this very nice paper by uh, Shizat and Simone, um, where what they did is uh, they tried to view this equation as a gradient flow um, in the hellinger kantorovich distance, which is kind of the first thing that you would want to do. You say, OK, I have this equation where mass changes. So let me just replace optimal transport with a notion of optimal transport that allows for changing mass. Um, and the problem is that uh, when you do that, the energy and this growth term have to be very closely coupled. Okay, so you can't actually choose them to be uh, completely independent. Um, but of course, when you can, uh, you get a very, very, very nice way of solving this equation. Um, the other thing you might think of doing, right, is just to do a splitting scheme. So you can say, let me just uh, evolve this part of the equation with a JKO scheme, and then I'll just do another step uh, where I handle this mass changing term. Um, and the problem is that this scheme uh, gets into a lot of trouble when you consider this incompressible case. Um, and it's because in this incompressible case, you cannot directly relate the pressure and the density to each other. Um, and so if you try to separate this part from that part, you're gonna run into a lot of trouble. Okay. So before I um, tell you guys what we did, uh, let me just say one more thing about uh, why this is probably not a gradient flow. Um, so of course there's some possibility, right? That there's some really, really crazy metric that uh, you, know, you can actually understand this equation as a gradient flow in that metric. But this inequality um, is sort of what convinces me that no, that's really not the case. So what is this? All we did was we took the equation, we integrated against the pressure. Um, and if you do this for uh, you know, just a W2 gradient flow, you get the energy dissipation inequality. So usually you don't have this term here. And it's just saying, right, that uh, basically all of the kinetic energy you spend is getting used to reduce the energy. Um, but that's not happening here because we're adding mass to the problem. Um, and so this second term here is kind of accounting for uh, how much you're kind of increasing the energy again when you continue to add the mass. Um, and so this energy is really not being dissipated. Okay, so for sure, it's not a gradient flow with respect to this energy. And it seems very unlikely that you can find some other kind of modified energy uh, where you can actually understand this thing as a dissipation inequality, at least for uh, completely general choices of uh, G. Okay, so we have something that's not, probably not a gradient flow. That's fine. Sometimes life just doesn't give us gradient flows. Um, but it turns out that you can still use the JKO scheme by making a very, very, very simple modification. Um, and this is what we did. So, this is our scheme for evolving the equation. And what do you do? You try to minimize the energy. And then you're going to have this extra term here. And this is sort of a term that's going to encourage growth. And then uh, we have this W2 term. And so you see that actually I'm not plugging in the density from the previous iteration. I'm plugging in the density and then I'm also allowing for some growth to happen. So again, this alpha is supposed to represent the growth rate. And by putting that in there, it sort of gets us around the problem that uh, W2 isn't defined between two densities of different mass. So what we're doing, right, is we're just saying, okay, that's fine. Let me just change the mass right here. And then uh, the row that I choose at the next time step will still have that same uh, mass. 
Um, and let me just say, you really cannot interpret this whole thing as a distance anymore. Okay, so if I didn't have this energy term here, and the only thing I had were those second two terms, then I have this term that encourages growth. So I grow because that's going to decrease uh, the value of this functional. But if this thing's not here, then I could just choose rho to be exactly this. And so I pay no transportation cost. Okay, so in this model, you are not paying for adding mass. Okay, so adding or even subtracting mass um, is not something that's really showing up in a metric in the same way that you would think about that as in like the Hellinger Kantorovich distance. Okay, so the only reason that transportation is actually going to happen is because I have this energy. The energy does not like mass buildup. And so if I grow, then I still want to do something to sort of push density away. Okay, so what we need to do now is we need to figure out F. Okay, so the question is, uh, if I want any G, is there some F that makes this work? And ideally, I would like F to be convex because I want to solve a convex variational problem. Okay, and so to do that, um, I'm going to analyze the dual problem. Um, so essentially, whenever I think about optimal transport, I always think about it from the uh, Kantorovich dual perspective. So um, I want to introduce that problem. And then basically all of the analysis, all of the numerics that we're going to do are going to be based on this dual problem. Um, so let me just introduce some notation that I'm going to uh, use. So um, here we have the C transform and the conjugate C transform, which are basically inverses to one another. Uh, this is the convention that's most convenient uh, for this problem. And uh, I'm going to suppress the notation on this time step tau, uh, but it's there, okay. Um, and then this is the notation that I'm going to use for the induced transport maps. So when I actually look at the argmen and argmax of these C transforms, I get these maps, which uh, if we're at the optimal pressure are going to be the optimal transport maps. Um, and then we'll also use this uh, C transform variation formula and if I was doing it with the conjugate C transform instead, then I would just get the conjugate map. Okay. So uh, to get to the dual formulation, we're just going to use uh, Kantorovich duality to write W2. Uh, there should be a soup here. So it's a soup over uh, this function P. Um, and once we do that, we transform the primal problem into uh, this mini max problem. And um, I've, re I've just rearranged the terms in a slightly more suggestive way, because if you look at this guy here, it essentially looks like a Legendre transform. And indeed, if we fix the pressure, we interchange and we minimize with respect to rho, then we are going to get uh, E star, which is, or minus E star. Uh, right, the Legendre transform of E. And one thing I wanna point out is uh, when you do this Legendre transform, you're actually minimizing over densities. And what that is going to mean is all of the slopes of E star have to actually be non-negative. So E star is both convex and increasing, um, and that'll be important in a second. Okay, so now um, it's much easier to understand this problem, uh, what F alpha is doing, right? Because now I just have F alpha and I have something linear in alpha. Okay, so we're gonna play the same game. We're gonna fix P, we're going to interchange, we're going to minimize over alpha. And um, this is the equation you get. And you see that alpha 
is equal to F star prime of negative PC. Okay, so um, I want alpha to be the growth rate. So I really want alpha to be equal to G of P. And so uh, this is the choice that I wanna make. Okay, so this G was supposed to be a decreasing function of the pressure. And that's great because here I have F star prime of minus A, right? F star prime, if it's the derivative of a convex function should be increasing, but I have the minus. So this thing is decreasing. Um, and so it means that yes, I can choose a convex F that will allow me to achieve uh, this desired growth rate G. Okay. Um, so now that we've done this, we can plug in this choice of alpha. And finally, uh, we get this dual problem. Um, and so it turns out that if you play around with uh, the uh, various terms that you got when you plugged in alpha, what you actually end up getting is this antiderivative of G. Um, and so uh, this is your dual problem here. So this almost looks like the dual problem that you get um, if you just try to look at the dual problem to the JKO scheme. The thing that is different is uh, this G term. Um, but the good thing is that this uh, G bar is a concave function, okay? So this is basically a uh, concave maximization problem. Okay, um, and uh, let me just point out that in this case where the energy is given by this power function, uh, this is exactly what the dual problem is gonna look like. And so if you wanna think about this uh, incompressible case where we send gamma to infinity, um, then this E star of P is exactly max P comma zero. Um, and so one thing that's worth pointing out is actually as soon as you look at a value of gamma that's larger than two, um, this uh, dual energy term is not going to be smooth. Um, and it turns out that this causes a little bit of an issue, uh, but you can get around that. Um, and even in the most singular case where you send uh, gamma to infinity and you really get um, a complete kink. Okay. So um, the uh, other thing I wanna say is there's actually a second way to write down this dual problem. Um, and this is because, right, I can keep playing around with C transforms. So if I take the C transform twice, I have to get something smaller. If I take it uh, three times, then I end up back where I started. And so if you plug the C transform of some candidate function uh, into this thing, you actually will always increase the value. Um, and so that tells you that any maximizer actually has to be a C concave function. Oh, and let me just point out, this is where the fact that E star is monotone is important. Okay, so uh, P C C bar is smaller than P. And uh, that means that this term um, is subtracting off less than this term. And so that's good. Um, and so since I know that any maximizer has to be C concave, I can also uh, think about this in the conjugate space. So I can also introduce this variable Q that is the C transform of P. And I can also think about the problem in this way and it's completely equivalent. Um, and this will be relevant when I start talking about uh, the numerics because we're actually going to optimize both of these problems simultaneously. Okay. Um, so uh, let me just talk about the optimality conditions for the dual problem because that's what will allow us to see that we're uh, really solving this uh, PDE that we care about. Um, and so uh, if you solve the dual problem, you have to satisfy this Euler-Lagrange equation. 
And this map is showing up uh, precisely because we took a variation through the C transform. Um, and that's going to induce a push forward of this measure. Okay, so this is what the optimal dual potential needs to satisfy. And what you can do is you can then check, well, all of these interchanges that we did, were they really justified? Do I really have strong duality here? And uh, the answer is yes. So if you actually just construct a primal solution row using this formula and alpha using this formula, then it turns out you can just check that the value of the dual function at PN plus one is equal to the value of the primal function at these uh, two minimizers that you've constructed. And so in fact, these have to be the primal solutions. Uh, so this really is rho n plus one. Um, and so strong duality holds, you can just use the dual problem to think about everything. Okay, so putting everything together, uh, this is what we get. So we get this duality relation between the pressure and the density. We needed to have that. Um, to be really precise, I should be saying that uh, these are in each other's subdifferentials, especially in the case where we don't have smoothness, but whatever, let me just write it like this. Um, and then we have uh, this push forward equation. And in fact, this is actually basically a weak encoding of that continuity equation PDE with a source term. Okay, so if I look at this discrete time derivative, I use the fact that I can write this term as a push forward of rho n plus one. What I see is that this term is exactly equal to this guy. Okay, so here is my source term showing up. So I'm getting dt rho times some test function. I'm getting the source term on the other side. And then this guy is actually a weak encoding of uh, the uh, divergence term. Um, so this inverse map is exactly uh, x plus tau gradient pn plus one of x. Um, and so this difference is essentially the dot product of the gradient of the test function with pn plus one. Uh, this is how much error you're making, right? It's the next term in the Taylor expansion. And so uh, as long as you can control this guy, then, um, and you have compactness properties, then you can verify that you're really solving this equation. Um, and I'm not going to say uh, too much more about the compactness and the convergence, because really uh, that just sort of falls into um, a lot of the stuff that's already very well known um, about gradient flows, um, especially the convergence of these two nonlinear terms. Actually, the convergence of this term is uh, a little bit more interesting, and there's some cases where it's very hard, but whatever. Uh, just believe me, this scheme does converge to the uh, PDE. Okay, the thing that's a little bit more interesting is uh, actually verifying that this has a comparison principle. Um, and so what this is just saying is if I feed two ordered densities into this scheme and I look at what pops out, then if the densities were ordered, then the solutions also are ordered, right? That's exactly what um, the, the comparison principle is saying. And of course, if I keep iterating the scheme, then I have this comparison principle forever. Um, and again, we're actually going to prove this using the dual problem. So in fact, it's enough to show that the optimal pressures are ordered because they're coupled to the optimal densities um, through the derivative of a convex function, right? That's monotone. So I just need to show the pressures are ordered. And um, it turns out that all you need is this very uh, trivial observation. So um, recall that these maps uh, T sub P are supposed to be the argmins of when you take the C transform. And what I'm doing is I just wanna look at the set where uh, P zero is smaller than P one. 
Okay, so these are just two secant k functions. I'm looking where p0, uh, sorry, is larger than p1. And the point is, if p0 decides to choose a point in this set u, then p1 has to also decide to choose a point in this set u. And uh, we'll, we'll also know that the C transforms are ordered. So the ordering of the C transforms is actually very easy because here I can just choose the minimizer that was chosen for P0. I know that's in U. P1 is smaller than P0 in U. And so of course this has to be smaller. And to see why T P1 has to be in U, if this guy is in U. I mean, basically what it's saying, right, is uh, P0 chose a point inside of U. If I was choosing something different for P1, either I have to spend more uh, in my transportation cost uh, to go somewhere else, but that wouldn't really make any sense because then I could have done the same thing with P0. And if I go outside with P1, then I could do a better job by choosing that same outside point with P0. Um, okay, and so this is the only way in which optimal transport is going to show up in this comparison theorem argument. Um, and so what's really interesting is we don't use anything about the quadratic cost. So in fact, uh, this observation is true as long as you have some cost that induces uh, maps, right? So as long as you know that you have a cost where maps exist, you have this lemma, and this is the only place we, where we're going to use uh, optimal transport in the sense that it's the only place where the C transform will be relevant. Okay. So now that we know this, um, basically the comparison argument is just this sort of two-liner, okay? So I have U, I look at the characteristic function of that set, and then I just integrate my optimality condition against chi, and this is what I get, right? So I have chi against this guy, it has to be equal to uh, the integral of chi against the push forward, which means I can just write that as chi composed with this map. Okay, and all of the inequalities here are straightforward, except when I go from this first line to this second line, that's where we're going to use that lemma. Okay, so here I'm on chi, that's where P0 is bigger. This is a monotone function. And so of course, uh, E star at P1 is smaller. Then I use the optimality condition. And now I wanna use the lemma. Okay, so if, this guy is equal to one, that means that T of P0 sent mass into U. And so that means that P1 must also do it as well. And so if this guy is non-zero, this guy is non-zero. Um, and similarly, I know that on that set, this guy is smaller than this guy, but G is a decreasing function. Okay, so, um, Basically, the lemma tells us that we can go from this line to that line. And then this last thing, I'm just using the fact that I know that row one is bigger than row zero. That's this inequality. And then I get back to what I started with, just using the optimality condition for P zero. Okay, and so we see that all of these inequalities have to actually be equalities. And so if E star, is a strictly convex function, or if G is strictly decreasing, that will only be possible if U has measure zero. Um, and if they're not strictly um, convex or strictly decreasing, well, you just approximate them with something that is, and then uh, the argument goes through. Okay, so um, that is essentially everything I wanted to say about the more analytic aspects. Um, I don't have that much time left, but let me just say a little bit about the numerics. Um, so uh, the way that um, I'm gonna simulate this problem 
is by using the back and forth method uh, to uh, solve the dual problem. So uh, the back and forth method um, I introduced with uh, Flavien Leger originally for solving um, just optimal transport problems. And uh, more recently, uh, in addition with uh, Wan Jun Lee, um, we extended it to gradient flows. And so now what I'm gonna talk about is using it to uh, do these tumor growth models. Um, and so, right, we're just going to uh, use this method to do uh, H1 gradient ascent on these two equivalent dual problems that will give us the optimal pressure. And then you can recover the optimal density uh, through either one of these two uh, relations that are linking the pressure and the density. So this relation always works. This one, things are potentially iffy when this guy is not smooth. Um, but actually in the incompressible case, you can recover the density from the pressure, even though you can't recover the pressure from the density. Um, and in general, you prefer to recover the optimal density uh, this way, because you know that this guy is a C concave function. It has good regularity properties, uh, whereas uh, computing this push forward is kind of a pain. Um, so this is what the algorithm looks like you alternate gradient ascent on one of these problems. You take a C transform to switch to the other problem. You do gradient ascent there, and then you switch back with the conjugate um, C transform. And we're doing all of these gradient updates in H1, and an H1 gradient is just equivalent to preconditioning L2 um, by uh, this, um, uh, Poisson equation, essentially. Um, and you can, at least if you're on a grid, uh, you can solve that very efficiently uh, with FFT. Okay, so why are we doing these things? Um, H1 is the weakest inner product where these two functions, I and J, have a hope of actually being smooth. Okay, so if I try to do gradient ascent, in some uh, weaker norm, it's going to be horribly uh, unstable. And this is precisely because of the C transform term. Um, the Hessians of these functions are really complicated. So they're not even guaranteed to be L smooth in H1. But again, this is the weakest possible space where that could possibly be true. Um, and actually another really nice thing about working in H1 is these non-smooth functions or things that we're used to thinking of as being non-smooth functions are actually smooth in H1 um, as long as uh, the boundary of these sets where the singularity happens is not too crazy, okay? And so it's basically the Hessian of that function is sort of going to be a singular measure that concentrates on the boundary. Okay, of course, you can't bound integration on a singular measure uh, in terms of L2, but H1 functions, you can actually integrate them on this boundary. Okay, so these functions, even though we're used to thinking them, thinking of them as uh, not being smooth, um, they kind of are smooth uh, in H1. Um, and uh, right, the reason you actually want to alternate between these two functions um, is because their Hessians are sort of inverse to one another. And so it means that uh, you can sort of always step in directions where your Hessians um, have larger eigenvalues, right? So where the eigenvalues of the Hessian of one function are small, they're big on the other function. And so this gives you a way to sort of uh, keep moving. Um, and uh, at least on grids, uh, you, can, you can compute these uh, C, tra C transforms um, very quickly. Okay. So um, I'm basically out of time, but uh, let me just show you guys a few fun videos and then I will stop. So um, these are all just going to be of the incompressible case. And so uh, all of these different shapes are gonna grow and they're gonna merge. We get topological changes and it's fine. 
And you can see that uh, the scheme is maintaining the sharp interface the whole time. Um, here's the same example, but with a uh, growth function that's more heavily penalized by the pressure and uh, it sort of just grows more slowly. Um, in both cases, uh, you see that at the end, the things start to become ball-like. And so it seems that sort of this uh, ball that keeps growing is an attracting solution uh, for everything. Um, and let me just say one thing we're oops, looking at doing in the future is this same problem, but with two cell populations. And uh, here things get much more complicated. You don't actually have a comparison principle. You have to worry about two different interfaces, um, but nonetheless, things at least uh, seem to work uh, reasonably well. And here's just one more video of that case. Um, and so let me stop there. I apologize uh, for going over. Any questions? Yeah, thank you very much for uh, the nice talk. So um, you might have already mentioned this, but why can't you use the Hellinger and Dorovich uh, distance in the scheme, in JK scheme? Uh, so basically, and Simone, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you do that, uh, then you can get PDEs that look like this. And so you see that these two terms have to be related to each other. Um, yeah, but so what I mean is that so when, when you when you consider the, when you add the additional potential, okay, because what you're doing so you consider an additional potential, mm -hmm. and you consider this term as an external potential, right? Because mm -hmm. then you freeze it because you you treat it as a um, as an explicit in, uh, in 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 the scheme, but then so what you do you consider the distance versus and distance between like rho and so these other like rho n one plus tau alpha. And then so what I'm saying, can you, can't you use there, Ellinger Kantorovich? So you add the additional potential. Would it make sense? So, the, so let me just see. Because when you add, so you see, when you add the additional potential, so, here, right? so then, then you, you need to pay a price uh, in terms of the mass, right? Yeah. And then, so the question would be, would it make sense to consider Hellinger Kantorovich? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you certainly could, um, but uh, I don't know if um, doing something like that necessarily allows you to access a larger class of equations. Maybe it does. Okay. Um, yeah. That was, yeah, it was a great idea. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? On Zoom? Okay, how, how can I read it? Unmute themselves. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah, whoever asked the question. Yeah, so the one who on Zoom, you can unmute yourself and ask the questions. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. okay. Oh, Leonard, do not unmute himself. No worries. Uh, tell me the question. Okay, Leonard will tell us. Uh, oh, I cannot read that. Uh, oh, sorry. He can't unmute himself. He has a very good reason. His daughter is sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> so can all you the type parents it? in the audience can uh, sympathize with that. So yeah, can you type it to me? Um, yeah, I'm hoping. Yeah. I think so in the meantime, is there any other questions from the audience? Why does the pressure depend on the density? Mm. So you you can take uh, right. You can take any essentially uh, any convex function e, but for it to really be physically meaningful, you probably also want e to be uh, increasing as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I just wonder that for, for your simulation, because you know they have this connection to the free boundary problem. Mm -hmm. So um, can you really, usually that's when 
this power of just infinity, right? Yeah. So is your scheme can handle that big of a power? Yeah, because right when um, that case is so when these go to infinity in the dual problem, you just get max of p comma zero. Um, and so you, you've traded a constraint for something that's not smooth. Um, but uh, right, so when you take uh, variations of this thing, you generate these singular measures, but because you do the, um, the update steps in H1, that's, that's fine, essentially. Okay, I have a, a Leonard's question. He says, thanks, Matt, for the nice talk. Can you relate this to the relatively unknown paper of Kinderlehrer and Walkington, approximation of parabolic equations using the Wasserstein metric from 99? It looks like you're taking a well, yeah. <laughs> it looks like you're taking a nonlinear version of their analysis where they consider mass variations given by a simpler source term, not depending on row or rho or p. Uh, to confess, I don't know this paper. <laughs> oh, I, I'm so, copying uh, the title right now in a little kindergarten. Yeah. yeah. I don't know what to do. Okay, so any other questions? Uh, Matt, let's thank Matt again. Okay.